Hi, this is Gary, Whiskey 4 Echo Echo Yankee, uh, recording this in May of uh, 2019, uh, getting ready for the uh, Dayton Hamvention coming up uh, later in the week. I uh, wanted to let you know about something that if you're going to be visiting Dayton either this year or in the future, there's a Voice of America Museum in what we used to call Bethany, Ohio. Uh, I guess it's also a Mason, Ohio. Uh, it's the former Bethany Relay Station, one of the uh, domestic transmitting stations from the Voice of America. As some of you know, I used to work for the Voice of America for about 20 years. And so coming uh, to the museum and, and seeing uh, things there kind of is like uh, going home. So if you're going to Dayton, I recommend you take some time to set aside and go visit the Voice of America Museum in Bethany. And one of the things that uh, they shared with me was a video produced by the Voice of America probably in about 1985. And uh, for me it's fascinating because I joined Voice of America in 1988 and I worked with a lot of these people. So let me share with you about a half an hour video right now of the Voice of America from the mid-1980s, courtesy of the Voice of America Museum in Ohio. This is a very rewarding time to be associated with the Voice of America. I am particularly proud of the contribution that VOA broadcasts have made to changes taking place around the world. In Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, Southern Africa, Latin America, Looking at all of these historic events, it seems to me that we're witnessing, as we never have before, the power of information, the power of ideas. As this democratization continues, ordinary citizens will be making decisions that affect their country's policies. It is so important that they understand America, that VOA continue to tell them about Americans, how we live, what we believe in, how our political, our economic, and social institutions work. Getting radio signals to VOA target audiences is an equally important task. While shortwave and medium wave are VOA's principal means of transmission, well, we're also looking to the future at advances, like digital radio, direct broadcasting by satellites. We expect to make full use of all of these technologies once they become viable. However, most authorities believe that shortwave is going to be essential well into the next century. Other major international broadcasters, the British, the Japanese, the French, they all agree they're continuing to build new shortwave facilities around the world. Shortwave is also darn cheap. It costs VOA less than two cents a week for every one of our 130 million regular listeners. Whatever the method of transmission, reaching VOA listeners takes the intelligence, the skill, the commitment of highly trained men and women to get the job done. This is the Voice of America, Washington, D.C. Dawn. Signing on. Radio signals from the Voice of America, carrying Hindi to South Asia, Spanish to Latin America, Arabic to the Middle East, Russian to the Soviet Union, Swahili to East Africa, Mandarin to China, French to Africa, English to the world. News and information in more than 40 languages, delivered instantaneously, unchecked by national borders reaching millions every hour, every day. This is the story of how VOA gets its broadcasts to listeners on every continent. A story of powerful radio transmitters, of giant relay stations, of antennas, of satellites. A story told by engineers and technicians who operate America's global radio network. This is the Voice of America, Washington, D.C. Stand by, please. Stand by, mic three. It is Ready, cart one. And here is the news from the Voice of America. Roll it. Stand by, mic three. Give mic. At the VOA, we're concerned with worldwide communication. I'm here to ensure that the audio is clear, that it is clean. So they want the quality at this side to be as nearly optimum as possible. Um, I work with microphones, the, the telephone systems, satellite links. Um, on a remote basis, we bring in correspondence from anywhere. Master control is sort of like a traffic jam on the freeway at rush hour. The 150 lanes of audio traffic coming into master control being funneled down 
to 100 lanes of tra audio traffic, leaving master control. That audio traffic includes the 50 studios from which the air shows are done, uh, our correspondent locations around town and around the world. Uh, it all comes in on one side of the room through the switcher right here, uh, leaves the switcher, feeds the output side of the room, which in turn feeds the network control center, which is responsible for making sure the programs get on the proper satellite channels for distribution to the transmitter sites around the world. OK, who am I speaking with? This is the Voice of America Network Control Center. Uh, this facility is responsible okay, for uh, the delivery of all VOA's programming. For the Botswana, you have a vertical of 140. We use uh, satellite communications, uh, telephone communications, microwave communications, T1 communications, fiber optics communications. Just about every form of communications developed by man to date is used by this facility to get the programs delivered to our relay stations in the United States and overseas. We transmit a point to multipoint system from here, 30 channels to the sky. The prime receiver of those channels is the Greenville Relay Station. The Greenville Relay Station is America's largest broadcasting facility. The purpose of the station is to take the broadcasts that originate in the Washington, D.C. studios of Voice of America and send them to our overseas listeners in the areas of Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and Latin America. To kind of compare it with a domestic radio station, uh, typically a domestic radio station has one program, one transmitter. The Greenville Relay Station has 22 transmitters, 73 separate antennas, and simultaneously sends programs, all of which are destined overseas. Now these transmitters, 10 of these transmitters, for instance, are one half million watt units, which is 10 times the power of the most powerful domestic commercial transmitters. This is one of the Voice of America's newest transmitters. This is a Marconi 500,000 watt shortwave transmitter. Actually, it's like two large cabinets with a hallway between them where we can get to the different doors to get into the different components of the transmitter room when we have to maintain it. This section, this is where the 500,000 watts of radio frequency power is generated. It's done with only two tubes. It can be on any of the frequencies within the short wave band also. The tuning and all of the mechanisms that uh, are used with the generation of the power are in that cabinet. In this cabinet, we have the tubes that put the program on this radio signal. The, uh, method of doing this is the latest state-of-the-art method called pulse width modulation. It has been incorporated in these transmitters because of the tremendous power savings that we can realize by using this type of modulation. Up front we have the control section. We have uh, microprocessors, we have uh, transistors and integrated circuits. All of this is state-of-the-art we have memory storage for the uh, different uh, control functions, and the metering is, is done at this point. So uh, what we have here is probably one of the very most state-of-the-art transmitters around. The advantages of shortwave radio are that you can broadcast very long distances with it. The problem that you have with the kind of radio that we in the United States are generally familiar with and listen to, such as FM and AM, are only short distance kinds of broadcasting. Shortwave, on the other hand, is broadcast by using the reflection of your wave from the ionosphere. So basically you're beaming your wave up and reflecting it off the ionosphere and it can come down maybe a thousand kilometers or more away from where your broadcast station is. And as a matter of fact, it doesn't only have to come down one time, the phenomena is indeed repeated. You do indeed get a reflection once the signal comes down the first time, and you get it bouncing off the ionosphere a second, and a third, and even more times. So it's not uncommon using shortwave radio to really get uh, tens, potentially, of thousands of kilometers distance.
It's much like being an artillery officer, because I have to figure the trajectory of the radio signal as it goes up 300 kilometers above our Earth and reflects back to the location where I want to be heard. If I calculate my angles wrong, I will either come too close or too far. And how HF radio really works is the design of an antenna that is like an artillery piece that fires the energy for, at the correct frequency and the correct angle to go into the ionosphere. It would be very simple if the ionosphere were a nice, smooth, reflecting surface like a mirror, for example, but it's not. And this complicates our life considerably because it's a statistical process in the sense that the ionosphere changes continually from day to night, from season to season, and even on a much longer 11-year type of cycle. The solar energy that creates the ionosphere is primarily in the ultraviolet bands. And this energy that comes from the sun is primarily from small spots. Actually, they're not small. They're even larger than the diameter of the Earth. The Earth could drop into these spots on the sun. The sun actually has other phenomena that are associated of particularly with, with the sunspots. And these are gigantic eruptions of energy called solar flares. Huge amounts of gaseous material will loop out from the sun's surface thousands of miles. With this occurrence, vast amounts of X-ray energy and gamma ray energy are released. And when that happens, we lose the ionosphere so that for the time that X-ray energy is coming from a flare and is striking the Earth, no shortwave radio broadcast can occur on the daylight side of the Earth. It completely blocks all bands. Going through this amorphous mass that's changing from moment to moment, from day to night, sometimes being there and sometimes not even being there, it makes the problem of delivering an HF signal a high frequency or a shortwave signal to a target audience, very difficult. By our work through uh, predictions and modeling, we should be able to deliver a better quality signal, meaning it's stronger and you can hear it more often. We again. need to select the best antenna, the best uh, direction for the antenna to point, and the best location for an antenna to be to get our signal. And we want them to get a good, strong signal that you know, it doesn't go in and out, it doesn't fade, and there's not a lot of static on it. So um, we have a map here. Now, what's yellow on here is what we try to design to. And what we consider here yellow is a good signal. Yeah, it, you'll hear uh, some very light static in the background and a fade or two, but it's a very good, high-quality signal from what you typically hear on a shortwave radio. Right, and if we're trying to hit an area, we want it to be yellow. And um, the green is what we consider our secondary um, level of signal, and that's, that's a little less than yellow. It's, it's got more static, um, you can't hear it as well, and the music doesn't sound very good on green. Mm -hmm. Tend to lose words from time to time, that sort right, of thing. Right. Yeah. And then red is um, a very strong signal. It's almost like uh, listening to an AM or FM radio. Perhaps two of the biggest uh, aids that, that come to my mind to, to help people try and increase their enjoyment of shortwave listening would be, uh, number one, the use of an outside antenna. In many parts of the world, people live in apartment buildings. These apartment buildings tend to be uh, made of concrete and steel construction. This kind of construction is actually like a shield around the radio. Shortwave radio has to be out in the air, and it's not practical to put the radio outside, so put the antenna outside. The other hint would be just very carefully tuning the radio, and this is the tuning knob on this particular radio. Um, you have to be patient in tuning this. It's not a easy, rough process. It must be done very slowly and very, very carefully. Because remember that the shortwave stations seem to be very close together. In fact, they are close together. And it takes a very fine, it takes a very gentle hand on the knob to, uh, to separate them properly. Hi, my name's Charles Oakley. This is my brother-in-law, Roy Briley. 
We are riggers here at Voice of America in Greenville. Uh, I've been here about 11 and a half years as a rigger. Roy here has been here longer than I. How long have you been about here, Roy? 17 years. 17 years. We both were in towers before we come to work here. Uh, I enjoy working with Voice of America very much. I, like, I enjoy being outside. Uh, I enjoy the challenge of tower work. The main type thing that we do here is a preventive maintenance schedule. We try to try to do preventive maintenance. We do have emergencies, uh, ice storms, rain causes some problems, and broke insulators and different things. But basically, we do our work on a once a year maintenance schedule. The big thing with our climbing here, though, is, is safety. It's it, we do get in some pretty bad spots at times, pretty bad shape. That can be dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. We, we look out for each other. We're checking for broken insulators, uh, arcs in the, in the curtain itself. Uh, Rusty carter pins. We change out rusty carter pins every time we see one, every now and then. Basically, you can, the work's good and you can really enjoy it as long as you take your time and be safe with the thing. So, I reckon I better get on and do what I got to do before they won't bring this one up. I think this antenna comes up very shortly. The VOA mission is so, so broad so complex that we need these program schedules in order to ensure that each language has adequate facilities to be heard by its designated target audience. For instance, here's a program schedule for one of our stations in North Carolina. And for each time period of the day, you can tell what each transmitter is doing. But more importantly, it tells the station staff when to turn on the transmitters, it turn, tells them which frequency to use. It tells them which antenna. <clears throat> and more importantly, it tells them which program to put on that transmitter. For example, if I want uh, uh, transmitter number four to be coming up on antenna 25, I would punch in antenna 25 and bring the, the antenna up on that transmitter. And at this point here, my transmitter is ready for an antenna. And we want to make sure that our technicians on the floor, which we rotate, has the correct frequency, and that transmitter also has the correct antenna. So when we start programming, we would want to make sure that that particular language is going through that transmitter. And we would monitor when the program time comes up, the sign-on time comes up, then we would listen to that particular program, making sure that it, if it's in Spanish or English or Arabic, then we would want that particular program to go to that country. I'm tuning one of the Voice of America's 250,000 watt transmitters. This is a very powerful transmitter. Approximately five times the power of the average transmitter that's in operation in North America. It's a very complicated machine and requires a great number of adjustments so that it be tuned properly. Once I've tuned the transmitter for its maximum output, I have assured myself that the uh, power will be sent to the antenna most efficiently and that ultimately the listener will receive the strongest possible signal. While Greenville's transmitters broadcast directly to listeners in the Caribbean, Latin America, and Africa, its satellite ground station passes Washington-originated programs on to VOA relay stations overseas, stations that, in turn, transmit the programs via shortwave or medium wave to audiences in other parts of the world. We use an Intelsat satellite that's located uh, about 20 degrees west of Greenwich, England, over the equator. It's a geosynchronous satellite, which means that it, with respect to the Earth, it appears to stay in the same spot. We use uh, uh, one satellite over the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, one of the beams down from the satellite covers Africa and Europe, and another covers North and South America. There's also an Indian Ocean Gateway site in England that rebroadcasts the programs from here back up to an Indian Ocean satellite that covers the Far East.
Las temperaturas en otras ciudades de los Estados Unidos. El agua fecha. This site here in Greenville is a gateway to the world for Voice of America. Avec choisi le Togo comme le welcome. The VOA Relay Station Network consists of 15 stations around the world. They're situated around the world as necessary to reach the various language areas that we're trying to reach, the 43 Voice of America language areas. These stations uh, are operated by a thousand uh, people. They operate on a schedule that uh, 935 times a day uh, bring a transmitter up and turn it off into a given language area. You may have heard of our uh, success in China. That is largely attributable to the contribution of the Philippines relay station to that schedule. Another area of, of great interest right now is, are the Baltic states and Eastern Europe. The Morocco station is one of the stations that broadcasts into this area for us and provides important uh, transmissions to that area. Mladší brat popraveného rumunského diktátora Nikolaj Čaušeska Andruta bol dnes odsúdený na 15 rokov odňatia slobody za genocídu a masovú vraždu. The thing that makes Morocco uh, unique is the people, the, uh, the, the ethnic differences uh, that you have here. My major responsibilities as a station manager uh, are to get the, the signal into the target area uh, in, a, in a reliable, quality manner, uh, and making sure that the timing and the, and, the, and the signal strength is what it should be to give our listeners the best quality signal we can. We do this on a on a 24-hour day basis, seven days a week. You must have the memo. Is here. Yeah. Okay. Cancellation is here. We resume normal right. operation on Tanger eight. Can we can we go talk a little bit? The uh, the Morocco station has 10 antiquated transmitters. Uh, very hard to obtain parts for. Very inefficient transmitters. Very low power. Uh, we have antennas of a very old design. We have great difficulty uh, competing with the other major broadcasters with their newer and more powerful equipment. So for this reason, we have a construction project to build a new station in Morocco that will service this area more effectively. A typical VOA shortwave relay station is probably comparable in size to a small town. Back when we negotiated our treaties with the host countries, we always requested large amounts of land. And in fact, in Morocco, we have 1,500 acres. In Thailand, we have approximately 1,200 acres. That's a humongous amount of land, and the re it is necessitated by the number of antennas that we need. The radio relay stations that we build consist of perhaps a 20-acre hub, which has all of the major buildings, hub meaning the central center where all the major buildings are built where all the actual business is conducted and the transmitter hall is located. The rest of the relay station is composed of the antenna field, which fills the remainder of that 1,500 acres. Now, the relay station itself is perhaps analogous to a small town because it has all the requirements that you would ever have in building a town. Now, this is uh, located far away from everywhere, so we have to create the whole infrastructure to support the station. Uh, we have to bring in the electricity, the water, and then we have to create our own sewer treatment plants and uh, everything that goes with it. It's an area where it's very normal to have 90 mile per hour winds to 100 mile per hour winds in the summer, very dry, or earth is very much in demand here. There's a lot of agricultural land surrounding the site where we can't use it as borrow area. So to build this station, we had to make up man-made mounds of dirt to build on top of it. Now, that entailed approximately 86 pieces of equipment, 470 people working 20 hours a day for seven days a week over a period of three years. Now, the uh, building itself uh, is just one piece of a puzzle. 
We have other buildings to support this building, but the main element of the station, of course, is the transmitters and the antenna. That's the name of the game. We're going to transmit out of here. These antennas, some of them will be over 500 feet high. When these antennas are complete, the entire site laying on top of this mud flat here is actually going to look like something out of space. It's something huge, and it's also beautiful. Our current training program was set up uh, about a year ago and uh, basically deals with the, with the technologies that the local uh, employees are going to need to, to simulate the technology that they're going to see with the new equipment that's going to be installed at the new facility to open in 1993. The other side. Uh, this is being done through classroom. Uh, uh, through a certified technical course presented uh, on an eight-hour-a-day basis uh, here at the uh, at this facility. Armature is movable. Okay. The other one is attending these training classes will understand our equipment better. You know what you're doing. It will help us easily travel through the transmitter and go to really directly to the point of failure. And attending these classes. You know what you're doing, really what you're doing, not just pushing the buttons. You know what you're really doing to the transmitter. A devastating winter storm rages across northern Europe. Transmitting facilities at VOA's Wolverton Relay Station in England are damaged. Programs intended for Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union will be lost unless another station can transmit them. A cable for help arrives in the Tangier control room. It is shortly before the station must make routine frequency changes for its own broadcasts to the Middle East. They're unable to carry the program. Some of their transmitters are down. So we're reviewing the schedule as the information comes in to see just where we can, if it's uh, consistent with what we have on the air now, and uh, we can put that on the transmitters. Then we'll acknowledge to them that uh, we'll get it on the air. And it came in a very critical period of time, you know, when, you know, crews are changing, you know, changing the shifts. Transmitter was scheduled at 1600, and we had to come, you know, that transmitter was 1600. The staff and its antiquated equipment must take on an additional operating schedule. Extra transmitters must be activated and tuned, antennas switched and frequencies changed, all within minutes. A difficult problem for the station. It will take uh, something like five minutes for the operators to go inside and change the coils and, and do the necessary for transmitter to tune on 9.7. Yes, they'll have to uh, switch the power off, put the grounding sticks on there before they can touch any of the. It's electrically hot as well as physically hot. There's quite a bit of heat involved in the area of the transmitter. We had to go inside the transmitter to preset, if we can say, the transmitter. And that took some time, you know, because it's, as I told you, it's not a routine work that we are, that we usually do. We corrected the transmitter loading condition to give maximum RF output from the transmitter. And that we could do it only when the transmitter was idle. And now as I can see it, it's about 125 kW input, which will give us something like 100 kW output from it. Transmitter was scheduled at 1600, and we had to come in with the transmitter with 1600. As a matter of fact, you know, Tangent 1 wouldn't work with that, this frequency and this antenna, you know, that these people gave us. And we had even arcing inside the transmitter, you know. And we had to have that transmitter ready in a short time, and yet noise-free, you know, problem-free. In this period of time, I have to change. I have 30 seconds to, to make my change. Mission accomplished. The programs for Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, and the Middle East are on the air. This is the voice of America, Washington, D.C., signing off. Yes, I, I was... No, 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 no. And so it continues. 
around the clock. Throughout the year, a flow of news and information from America to tens of millions of listeners around the world, delivered by the people who operate VOA's global radio network. This is the Voice of America. The following program is to Czechoslovakia. The following program is in Farsi. This is the Voice of America broadcasting to Africa. The following program is in French. The following program is in Hindi. This is the Voice of America. The following program is in Amharic. The following program is in Spanish. The following program is in Arabic. The following program is in Cantonese. You are listening to The Voice of America, Washington, D.C.